the dead dive. What, Captain Hollister? Everybody's dead dive. What, Top Hunter? What, Selby? Not Chen. He's dead dive. Everybody is dead. Everybody is dead dive. Hello there, Smegheads. See, I feel I can say that now. I feel like I've watched enough. Welcome back to Everybody's Dead Day, a Red Dwarf review podcast featuring myself, Adam Martin, and my co-host as always. I can't believe you just called everyone Smegheads. That's so rude. <laughs> um, I'm Phil Hawkins. Uh, I am the other presenter on this program. He is, yes. And the, the seasoned fan, if you like, someone who's watched for decades, whereas I'm the relative newbie. This is my first rodeo through and you know smakehead's used as an insult but i also feel red dwarf fans use it as a you know as an affectionate way no no it's, no, no it's an insult you're you're cancelled oh that's it i'm cancelled i'm out the fat i'll, I'll leave you have to get a new co-host yeah, new co i'm auditioning so. now um get your applications cancelled. in no Absolutely no of course cancelled. not we, we we uh we love the affectionate smakeheads who doesn't who doesn't um but thank you for joining us once again we're on series six episode five the penultimate episode this is rimmer world and we'll be getting into that. Uh, and yeah, Sounds this like a one theme kicked... park, doesn't it? I know. Do you know what? I low, I low key when I saw the title, I was like, I really hope this is like you know the, what was the classic South Park episode, Cartman Land. I was like, I really hope it's like that. Um, just you know, all I, mean, all I can people... say is wait till next series. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to leave sh- it there. I, I shall. Uh, I mean, some of you might have seen this. If if you haven't spoilers, it's it's not like Cartman Land, uh, but that, that's okay. That's okay. That's fine. Um, we actually start with Rimmer having a medical exam, uh, which I found quite odd considering he's a hologram. But you know, alas, holograms need the maintenance as well. And um, we learn pretty quickly after some uh, funny banter with Crichton that um, not all is well with Rimmer, is he? He's actually. We learn that it's actually uncommon but possible for a hologram to die which made me laugh because it sounds so ridiculous you know it's he's like, already dead yeah like how can a hologram die but then uh, you know we sort of get this explanation don't we about how he's he's getting wh- what is it like when he dies the algorithm like copied uh, yeah he's, well, everything about him, there including might have been the an error there yeah in the algorithm and something to do with stress makes it worse so yeah don't get stressed <laughs> Yeah, don't get stressed. And then, of course, much. as we all know, telling someone not to get stressed <laughs> is the easiest way to make Only them. makes it worse. Stressed. And he recommends, doesn't he? He says, you know, take it easy, get some rest, have some exercise, nothing too strenuous, uh, which almost immediately gets thrown out the window because they head to the cockpit. And uh, like last week, we've got another returning element, haven't we? We do. Before we get to that, I just on the medical test, I was going to oh, say no, that, for- yeah, he's had an eye test and... He's scolded for cheating on the eye test by writing the by sneaking in there the night before and writing the eye test down on his shoes, which is I don't know, presumably closer to his eyes than the actual test. Uh, but that that absolutely made me think. <laughs> talking of callbacks, series one where he was going for the officers' exams and he was like scrawling stuff yes. on his arms trying to cheat. It felt like a bit uh, of a callback to that. Yeah, how he how he sort of wants to do well, but he can't sort of do it without cheating or getting an unfair advantage. Although I yeah, must say, yeah, and specifically uh, the fact that he scrolls the answers over bits of his body as well. Exactly, and I mean, I I've got to be honest, I'm I'm partially sighted, right? So I, I you know I go for checkups a lot, do the eye test. There was a point in my life when I was about eleven where I was going every there was I had glaucoma basically, so I was going very frequently. And it got to the point where they they never changed the thing on the eye test board. So I did actually know the first two lines off by heart. And I, but I couldn't sort of live with it. So I sort of came out and said, look, I'm going to be real with you. Like, I, I know this chart. Like, it's not going to be an accurate yeah, representation. Yeah, because also it must be very difficult to know if... Because your brain is quite... The brain's an amazing thing. And it will fill, oh, it yeah. in, fill in that information for you. So even if you wouldn't be able to see it, you may think you can see it because you know it and it, because your brain is filling that information in to that visual bit for you. Yes. So, yeah, you don't even know. You're not even necessarily trying to cheat. You may think you can see it, whereas actually it's your brain filling it in. It's 
Yeah. It is tricky. They've got they've developed different methods over the years of do it apart from you know the standard read the wall. But yeah, it's a it's a funny one. But sure enough, in the cockpit we see the return of the simulant ship, which we saw. Oh yes, it was, and it is the it same was, one that they've they've destroyed as well. Yeah, which I was gonna say when I saw it, I was like, wait, didn't we? I was like, didn't we blow this up? Like, <laughs> wasn't this a thing? Yeah, clearly it didn't get completely destroyed. It was just. Wow. Heavily damaged, enough to kill... Heavily damaged. Kill the crew, but uh, still leaves some stuff salvageable. Well, if we've learned anything from Red Dwarf, it's that apparently no ship is gets destroyed. Every ship is somewhat indestructible or bounces back, Starbug being the main example. But, um, yeah, we've got another callback. Um, a lot of callbacks this series, really. The last episode, which was... Uh, um, the Polymorph sequel. Obviously, we, we mentioned there we had a lot of callbacks, big and small. Um... How do you, uh, someone who's watched this before, then, how do you feel about all these uh, callbacks in Series 6? I love them. Um, and I think probably it contributes, as well as there being just some really good solid stories in this series, um, I think the callbacks also contribute to the gen. Because I think generally amongst the Red Dwarf fandom, Series 6 is one of the highlights. It's the one that is often always really looked upon fondly. Series 5 as well, but Series 6 especially. And it's it's got some solid stories in there, definitely. But also I think this kind of world building and c- coming back to things that they've done before, either sure. earlier in the season or previous seasons, I, I think that contributes to that a lot. Yeah, no, for sure. And it's nice to see something return from this. It was because it's this same season, isn't it? The simulants appeared yeah. earlier in series six so there's not been that much of a gap really and i guess it sort of helps feed into this overarching search for red dwarf it sort of ties them into it as well um but they you know they they can't see any they're not sure if any simulants are are aboard at first but although rimmer of course being the coward that he is is like oh no we shouldn't go aboard and all this sort of stuff but um lister sort of takes charge on that doesn't he about how their supplies on there and that's what they need yeah and also there is um they say, oh, we, uh, let's hope they're resting in Silicon Hell, a nice reference back to the Silicon Afterlife yep. from previous seasons. Because yes. as we all know, Silicon Heaven must exist because where would all the calculators go? Well, now we know what goes to Silicon Hell. It is apparently <laughs> photocopiers. <laughs> photocopiers, yes, that's the photoc- where they all go. The, that's how we know Silicon Hell is, where, Hell is real because where would all the photocopiers Where would go? all the photocopiers go? Cements it in there, doesn't it? Um before they board the ship, though, I've got to say, we get the now standard space directive joke. And this was like this was the one about, you know, if a male member's caught sniffing the exercise bike after a female member, I think. And like the joke was a little better than the one last time. But I, per, I, I feel it like it sounds really, like you're getting tired of these. We're, stre- space we're stretching joke, it now. Jokes now. No, as, as I said, like when they started doing it, I'm all for it being a thing every episode. Don't get me as long as the punchlines are really solid. And just for me, especially over this week and last week, they've just not been the best punchlines. They've just sort of fallen a bit flat for me. They're not, you know, comedy subjective, as we've said before. Like, you you know, I'm sure some people out there found it hilarious. But yeah, for me, recently, these punchlines to these space directive jokes aren't really landing for me. And as a result, I'm feeling, okay, the entire concept of the joke's growing a bit stale now because it's just not as funny as it as it was initially. Yeah, I I think possibly right. I can't remember how long they keep them up for either. I can't remember if it goes into, you know, the next several seasons. or Because what I think they would be better is if they didn't do one every episode and it was maybe yes. like two or three. It could still be a reoccurring gag, but two or three times a series, maybe max. Three times max a series, given you mostly only got six episodes a series. So not having one so often would probably make it not feel as tired. Yeah, and I think when, you, when you're when you trying to do it every episode, you, you sort of create that pressure for yourself to write like a really strong gag every week and it's got to be inserted at some point, you know. And yeah, I don't know. It's just at the moment, it's starting to wear on me a bit now, the whole idea of it. Mm. But yeah. Although one joke that didn't, I, I found it really funny, uh, is when obviously... Uh, 
Rimmer is having almost like these, you know, hyperventilations, almost like a panic attack. And Crichton's given him a pair of Chinese worry balls, which I, I'd never heard of before. I don't know if that's a real thing. Yeah, um, yeah. I think I've got some actually somewhere up in the loft. They're, right, they're just okay. two like metal balls that you can, it's the, you know, it's just something to take your mind off stuff. It's it's the equivalent of a fidget spinner, I guess. I was going to say, it's like the fidgets yeah. you can get or like fidget cubes and things like that. It's just like something that. for your hands to do. Um, yeah. And you just sort um, of but... roll them around your hands. The line that got me was the... Uh... When he saw the bellows, grind those balls, sir, grind them. You know, just <laughs> really great execution from Robert Llewellyn. And yeah, just got, again, unexpected, but it got me laughing. So I did enjoy that gag. Yeah. So they go aboard the simulant ship, which is in a, as as mentioned, got, well, destroyed in inverted commas. Um, it's in a big, big state of disrepair. And any major loud sound they make, it, even using their bazookoids, uh, will cause a ship quake and pretty much destroy what's left of it. Um, Which Lister hasn't yeah, li- told them. He's like, he's yeah. gone over there, let them take the bazookoids just for show and not told them that they can't use them until they get there. Yeah, he's withheld a lot of information from them, actually, like throughout this whole set. You know, there's he keeps saying, doesn't he? He's like, oh, I should tell you this now, or I should tell you that. And um, yeah, a bit unlike Lister, really. We don't see that often. Yeah, because he's, he's didn't earlier, he changed the readings on a screen so the cat wouldn't realize how was it ox no not oxygen some they were low on it something. was some yeah yeah it just it seems something more like i don't know maybe rimmer would do you know it, yeah it yeah it seemed like a very listery thing to do but then i guess you could argue his plan was so audacious that he maybe knew the others wouldn't go along with it unless he didn't tell them these things beforehand i suppose that's probably um, what it is yeah probably yeah um, but they, they do find this food and they find a teleporter as well. Very handy. Yeah. And they start moving the food uh, aboard Starbug. But as they're doing that, um, they discover they're not alone on this ship. Um, and they the female simulant encounters them. Now, is this was this the same act, actor or same character from a few episodes I ago? I don't or? know, actually. I don't actually know. Let's... Well, she seems to like remember them. You know, she refers yeah. to like the earlier encounter and like you destroyed my ship Let's and nearly me. destroyed me or whatever. So I'd like to think it's because I think when we saw them before, it was mainly the male simulant that like took most of the lines and the dialogue. But there was a female simulant in that episode standing behind the male one, wasn't yes. there? Yes. Yeah. Um. Let Let's so, Let's look this up on IMDb. Yes, yeah, I just like to think, especially because it's the same season as well. So it all would have been recorded quite close to each other. So, I'd, you know, it's not it's not out of reason to suggest, at least. Any luck? Yes, it is indeed the same the same actress from Government of the Apocalypse. Yes. No, oh, fair. That makes that. Well, again, that makes sense, I guess. Yeah, doesn't it? that it would be. And it was only in Government of the Apocalypse. Only two episodes. That's yeah. I didn't realize it was only that short of a time. Um so she confronts them and uh, is clearly showing, you know, a list of tries to act all bravado, saying they're at a stalemate, you know, no one can fire. She defies that pretty quickly. You know, she fires a shot. She doesn't really care about what's going on. I did love the fact that when she confronts them, uh, Kat's main worry is that last time they met during the company of the apocalypse, he was wearing the same outfit. The same outfit, and yes. But he does not want this getting out. So he's like, one of the suckers bumps into me, he'll be lunching on later. Last time we met, I was wearing the same outfit, and no one's going to survive to tell that story. <laughs> he alludes to it a few times with that outfit, and again, it just it, it, it's nice that they haven't forgotten that... Obviously, Cat's changed a lot in the last few series, but he is still very much that fashion-conscious character we knew who wouldn't be seen dead in the same outfit twice. Um, so yeah, no, it was a great gag. What also was a great gag was what Rimmer's doing throughout all of this. Um, we see that he's behind her, and you know, think that he's going to shoot her down uh but then he sees an escape pod and start and you get this great bit with lister you know saying these things like i'm trying to tell you to change your mind and the simulants all confused like i don't understand what you're not grasping it I, it was a great bit of both physical comedy and also just the well i guess in terms of like you know wordplay and stuff i really liked it yeah no i think it worked really well and combined with rimmer doing his little thing going you can kind of see him momentarily go oh, yeah he has to think do. about it he no i'm gonna save it. myself of course standard standard for rimmer um 
But to his discredit, I suppose, activating the escape pod triggers the ship quake. And uh, it does it does take out the simulant, doesn't it? I think. Yes. You know, but we need to get the character yeah. out the and way. And the rest oh, have she, to escape falls on her via, head the, um, via the teleporter, which is very via the teleport, there, which is what they've been teleporting the supplies back with as well. Yes, and could and has a twenty percent chance of turning them inside out, which Cat's not bothered about because the inside of his uh, outfit is what did he say? It was like um, uh, purple velvet or something like that. He's happy with the material. He, he doesn't. Yeah, he'll be, he'll be cool with that. Um, but they make it back fine. But they've also made it back to Starbuck, But they've gone back in time a little bit. Got some timey wimey action. Um, yes, this this scene felt really random um, at the time, and it was only really. At the end of the episode, which we'll get to, which I was like, okay, I can see why they have done it to do this setup at the end. But here it just felt like, oh, you've just randomly time traveled to have a conversation with all of yourselves a week ago. How yeah, how weird. Uh, yeah. And I was trying to think to myself, I was like, Red Dwarf's the kind of show where maybe we would have actually seen this scene play out, you know, earlier. And now it's making sense. But I was like, no, I don't think we have seen, like, as you say, they literally just throw this in there and like it does make more sense when we get to the end but i don't know even with the end in mind i don't think you really needed this scene obviously you know it's done mainly as a gag like oh Crichton's, you know in a panic he's miscoordinated everything or whatever but yeah i think even when we get to the end scene and we'll talk about it but i think even with that end scene in mind you didn't this one wasn't quintessential yeah maybe yeah it was a bit it, it, it does stick out a little bit i have a feeling and, I, and i'm not 100 percent sure on this i have a feeling that it might play into some stuff next episode um sure we, yeah which we will mention at the end of course yeah I guess that ties yeah but it, uh but i can't remember yeah. if it absolutely completely ties in or if it's yeah it just felt a little bit random at the time although i did love Crichton being angry at himself, <laughs> like past Crichton being angry. Because of yeah. course he would be. But also, of like, course he would be. I, I don't know why I'm trying to think of the logic of time travel in, in Red Dwarf Universe, but <laughs> do they not remember seeing themselves? <laughs> or yeah, is this now making know, a new it, timeline? I mean, yeah, who knows? Well, they do so, They do say, wasn't it someone recognizes, oh, this is from like a few weeks ago. Who says that? Or maybe, I, I don't know. Timey-wimey stuff from Red Dwarf, you know, as you say, the logic of it, there is no logic. Um, but once they've sorted that out, they're back in the present. Uh, we get a great effect of the simulant ship exploding. I thought that looked really good. Yeah. Uh, model work-wise, as as it always is in Red Dwarf. We, we love the model work here. Uh, Rimmer has survived, but he's accelerating away from Starbug in an escape pod. And one of my favorite lines is when... They get back in the cockpit, the three of them, and Kat says, "Ah, oh, all in all, 100% successful mission or day or whatever. And they say, oh, but we're still missing Rimmer. And he just repeats the like, it's so good, such great delivery. And normally, um, I'm a bit like, oh, come on, you've been a bit, you know, the Kat's snide remarks at losing or like sometimes he's like, yeah, quick, let's get out of here before they can bring Rimmer back. And it feels like they he really hates him and it's unjustified a bit, even though Obviously, Rimmer is a bit of a smeg and a bit annoying. It feels a bit too harsh. Here, though, yeah. given what Rimmer has just done, <laughs> I, he's completely justified. Oh, meant, yes, yeah, completely justified. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's lots of great little quips in there as well, um, especially when we find out about the, the time difference, because we're, deal we're dealing with wormholes now, um, which, of course, uh, sci-fi fans might be familiar with, but it's this whole... Uh, concept of time differentiation isn't it you know if you pass the wormhole mm. time moves differently so um well and what is it for rimmer it's going to be 600 years but for the other lads it's only what is it um, a couple of hours is it or yeah something like that i wasn't quite entirely did, so did they not go through the wormhole well no they do because there's that shot of starbug going into so why does it not take 600 years I... i'm very confused <laughs> It's the trouble, isn't it? Well, I mean, wormholes, te when you're dealing with like wormhole stuff in any sci-fi show, I think the the key is in the explanation because, of course, you'll have like sci-fi buffs who, who get it instantly. But you, I guess you also have to cater to like the general audience as well. Um, like I, Doctor Who fans cite, is it World Enough and Time? You know, with the whole the ship that won. Yes. People cite that as a really good example of explaining how, I guess, wormhole yeah. or time differentiation works. 
This one, I feel maybe because Red Dwarf's only 25 minutes or whatever, they sort they do explain it, but they, they rattle through it at a breakneck pace. So maybe yeah. it's like, maybe they don't, I don't know, maybe they don't explain it clearly enough or they don't explain why it doesn't take the other lads 600. Because you're right, they both clearly, and, and they show it, they show the shot, they both go into the wormhole. So why it doesn't then take the other three lads 600, you're right, yeah, you're completely right, it doesn't. It seems a bit odd. Yeah, I suppose now you've said the world enough and time thing. I suppose it's maybe a similar thing. Like there, he's closer to it at that point. So from their perspective, that I don't know. Who, they, it's I'm, red. I'm it's red dwarf, it isn't red dwarf. it? It's, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's red dwarf. Um, but they lose contact with him. Serum is on his own, and he's stranded uh, on what we see as like a desert terrain, almost like Tatooine ish. Um, he records a log about his uh, uh, travels and he creates as he says rimmer rimmer world but so you know we go from like the desert and then it's like oh this forest fauna is it i might have missed it but is it explain exactly how he does that or why that happens uh what the terraforming oh right oh yeah because he said he had some terraforming equipment right yeah so the, right, the ship okay. is, is equipped with terraforming equipment and that is what the the things he shoots into the sky are Right, right. I must have just obviously slipped sets, my mind then. Sets off some kind of uh far like on fast forward ecological development where suddenly within six days after much rainfall there's a whole forest there. Yes, yeah. No for sure. Okay, well okay, well that makes sense. Um but of course Rimmer would name this world after himself. That's the most Rimmer thing he would do, I guess. Um and in his log, he decides he wants to clone himself because he has the tech, doesn't want to be on his own. That's valid. Um, yeah, but not 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 exactly clone himself. He wants to clone a he wants to clone a female based himself. on his DNA. Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, and a slightly icky line about him saying, technically, she would be my sister. Yeah, that line. Uh, but I, mean, I figure I won't tell her. I did think, like, when he was explaining it, how he says, oh, that would be my sister. As soon as he said that, I was like, we're probably going to get a bit of a cringy joke that is about incest and all that. And I know, it again, it's a sci-fi comedy that it doesn't, you know, we he doesn't deliver on that line because obviously it doesn't happen. But Yeah, and it's meant yeah, to be it's just a li- you're, you're meant it to, is, as the yeah, audience, you're you're meant to it's designed that you cringe at that. That is what yeah. it is for. It just makes you think, like, Rimmer, man. Like, come on. Like, that's... <laughs> Come on, man. Um, but as we say, it doesn't happen because the clone ends up being himself. And, it well, we see the one, um, and it, but it just seems to keep We see happening. a lot of the one. We see a lot of... <laughs> that is true. We see a lot of the one because by the time the other lads have reached the Rimmer world, uh, forget the 600 years thing, of course. We won't get back into that. Um, but they arrive and uh, they are surrounded by several Rimmers, all in sort of Roman Romanesque... Um, armor. D- I don't know where he got that from, but it, hey, it's it's there. Um, probably forged it, I guess. Um, and they're taken to a a Rimmer who is sat on a throne, uh, the king of his own world. Now, what did you? I'll give my thoughts in a minute. But you know, this Rimmer, the one on the throne, shall we say, the yeah. emperor, if you like. What did you think of this Rimmer or this characterization of this Rimmer or this scene, if you like? Well, I. I already knew where it was going, having seen it before. Right. Um, that's interesting. Did did you get? At what point did you guess this wasn't Rimmer? Um, if I'm on it, it might make me sound a bit dim, but I think it was honestly when they said it. Yeah. Um, because obviously I did notice because the Rimmer on the throne did have a H on his head, mm. whereas the others, like the soldiers, didn't. So at first I thought, okay, you know that makes sense. This is the original Rimmer, you know, clearly gone mad or gone loopy or whatever but then when Crichton was like oh maybe the h denotes power which again makes sense because he's this one's on the throne and then when they say it so i was like okay that makes sense because uh, but, but yeah this this characterization chris barry as we've said is a great actor great impressionist great he, he delivers unique characters i I thought this version of rimmer because he's done several at this point mm-hmm. was a bit weaker or one of my least favorites um the sort of the sort of, you know, booming emperor sort of thing that he goes for. I get what he's going for. It's like a pastiche of all, like, the old like old films or stuff with, like, those sort of characters that 
shout really, or the, they're very dramatic in how they speak, or whatever, yes. you know, that Silence. sort of thing. Yeah, kind of thing, yeah, and I I get it, but I don't know. I don't know what it was. I just, I didn't really warm to it as much as his other side rimmers, if you like. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, but that's that's just me. I'm sure some people. Loved I think because it, it was. I mean, yeah. it was a very short bit. I suppose. Um, it didn't. It didn't bother me. It kind of served its purpose, and yeah, it was alright. Yeah, yeah. You do get some funny moments, like obviously when he sends away what appear to be his like maids or whatever. Oh and yes, of course. Because yes, because they he, are just. He rimmer. has he has uh, succeeded in making female clones. We can tell they've got female bodies, but they do have rimmer faces. His face. <laughs> Yeah, but these, well, this Rimmer has no problem because we learned that in this society, if you don't look like Rimmer, then you're, you're, you're an outcast or an abomination. Yeah, an abomination. A, it's so, a heresy to not look like Rimmer. A heresy. And, uh, and so apparently, as is... we find out, um, when, he's then, when they're then thrown into the jail and they meet mm. actual Rimmer, <laughs> yes. who doesn't remember their names because for him it's been 600 years. So he's like, what does he call them? Um uh Derek is it Derek Custer? Yes. Um uh, uh Cru- what was it? Titan and Kit. And, and Kit, yeah. that's it, yeah. <laughs> um and it's also we find out it's also a crime to be brave, a crime to be compassionate, to be sexy, to be noble yeah. or charming as well. So all the things Rimmer is not, yes. basically. Which again makes sense because they're all cloned from here. Yeah. Um but they're in this cell and they've they've got a plan and escape, right? Because they they know if they stay here, they're probably gonna get killed. You know, yeah, and he's been no in the cell for most of the 600 years. I think it's like 557 years out of the 600. Some like Rimmer has been in this cell because, every, of course, all the clones being Rimmer, they're all backstabbing, treacherous, <laughs> scheming bastards. And, uh, <laughs> and at the first opportunity, they overthrew threw him and Absolutely. stuck him in the jail. Which again, and tried to kill him sense. as well, but they couldn't. Yeah, well, it plays into quite nicely, actually, into earlier in the episode when obviously Rimmer takes the escape pod. How he basically backstabbed his teammates when he could have he could have shot down the simulant himself. Yes, so yeah, exactly. I thought that played in quite yeah. well for this episode. And he's he's been in there also so long that the Chinese stress balls oh, yeah, or whatever it was have wound down and so like small. worn down to tiny little like yeah. pellets. But he's still got them, so they must be made of pretty pretty strong stuff if they're still even a thing by after nearly six hundred years. Um, but they plan this escape. Lister has a grand idea, you know, about using ropes and stuff, about how he's going to get out. Very elaborate idea. Very elaborate, especially Many for stages Lister. to this plan. Many stages. And then Crichton just chimes in with, well, we could just use the teleport. <laughs> Which, I must admit, I, I quite liked it just because of how, you know, how nonchalantly he mentions it. And it it is quite funny how, you know, Lister has just gone all this way of explaining this very detailed plan. And Crichton's like, eh, yeah, but... <laughs> teleporter though right um which they do they all get out and they're back on starbug but this time they're in the future it seems um, yes well they don't know that initially they don't know they, it at they, first. they think they're in the past and they keep on like they're like kind of teasing their what they think is their past selves going on yes. like oh yeah rumor world and you're gonna be in jail for 557 years and then uh and like having a bit of a laugh and then they find out that actually oh no yeah they say oh no that was weeks ago yeah and he says oh we're actually is like something's happening to lister at this point in the future something horrible's happened to lister and the episode ends which uh so i do you yeah, think because we, we get this cliffhangers happen occasionally they do they and do sometimes something happens with them Sometimes yep. they're never mentioned again. Sometimes <laughs> we get a random quick scrolling bit of text to tell yes. us what happened. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? I'd like to think the fact that next week is the, is the series finale and, you know, it's the whole we're still searching for Red Dwarf at this point. Um, the, and it is the future, of course, um, assuming that each episode of Red Dwarf takes place, you know, on a linear moving timeline. That yes, I would like to think this gets resolved next week. I'm not, you know, I'm not placing any bets because Red Dwarf sometimes just throws that out the window. But I think in this case, yes, I'd like to think this does this does continue. And obviously, I don't know, but I ha- I have seen the title of the next episode. I was going to ask you that time. actually. Yes, I was going to ask. That title you. alone makes me think. Okay, well, if we're already in the fa- uh, the future and we've done the past, yeah, I'd like to think this concludes. But hey, we'll okay. we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. We'll come back to this next week. Um, on this ending, though, before we do our usual segments, I was getting a bit worried because when we're in the cell, 
I just flicked to the time code and I was like, oh, we've literally got, you know, a minute left when he says, oh, let's use the teleport. Mm. And I was like, I was really, really worried that we were going to get the most, ru- you know, they were literally going to appear back on Starbug and that was it. Do you know what I mean? Like we were going to get the most rushed ending in the world. Um but when it ended on a sort of cliff, I was like, that, w- yeah, I was like, I get it. If you're making this a two-parter, sure. You know, that's, which I think reinforces why I think it will be. Because if it, if this is just an ending and they don't acknowledge it. Okay. And that's a, that's a pretty weak ending, isn't it? Like, oh, we've done this thing of Rimmerworld. Oh, no, but yeah, we're done. Like that, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't yeah, know. the it ending's just seems... the thing. I think the time travel bit at the end kind of adds an, a little bit of a coda to it. In a kind, of, I think if they'd ended it with just escaping the, if it had ended just escaping the prison and teleporting, and they just teleported straight back, and then in the end the episode had ended, that would have been a bit. That would have been really too much, too quick. Yeah, um, but also it, the stuff at the beginning with uh, not Crichton, sorry, Rimmer having the you know all the problems and the yeah um, like the stress and stuff. Like I know, like the idea of being on Rimmer World is like his his time away. But I, per again, just me personally, I would have vouched for more time on Rimmer World. Like you know, get to Rimmer World sooner, um, rather than have the stress stuff because it does. You know, there are great gags in it and it does work. But I feel once we're on Rimmer World, aside from that brief bit, like you said, where you see the Chinese worry balls are like really small, that thing of him being stressed or suffering these attacks isn't really acknowledged no, again once we're on true. Rimmer World. So in my mind, I'm like, well, how about we just start with the whole, maybe start with they find the simulant ship, you know, and they're on it and then all oh, the events rather than, because just, I don't know, the opening scene made it seem as if this whole thing of Rimmer getting these attacks was going to be a thing throughout all of mm. it. But then once we get to Rimmer World, it just sort of stops being a thing, really. But that again, that's just that's just my personal view. But, no, that's fair. Yeah. Well, that is um that's another episode. That's series six, episode five, Rimmer World. So we'll get to our usual segments. The first of which being our favourite character from this episode. So go on, Phil. Who uh, who stole uh, it? For I'm you? gonna give it to Crichton. Okay. There were okay. just uh, it's lots of individual little moments, and again, Robert Llewellyn is just um really good at the reactions and things. Is. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he, I can't. I can't even remember the exact lines now. But like him being angry with his future self when they do the time traveling and things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, he had a lot of good one-liners in this one. I'll give you that. Absolutely. Well, mine. It might sound obvious. I'm going to have to give it to Rimmer. Um, Chris Barry's performance throughout was great even though i said i didn't really like the sort of roman emperor style i still thought it was good like from an acting standpoint um yeah he just really sold it as he usually does but since this is a rimmer focused episode i liked it a lot as well so that was my favorite um what about your funniest moment there were a few contenders um and all of them were Crichton moments so (laughs) that hence why he's my favorite character i think for this episode as well so i've already mentioned the him getting angry with his future self a bit yeah. in the time traveling uh there's that all we could use the teleport that got a good laugh out of me um yeah. i'm actually going to give it to though i think a moment that that the scene where he realize he gets the results of, of rimmer's diagnostic medical whatever we're oh, calling yes. it are you of the school that when faced with bad news prefers to hear that news naked and unvarnished or are you of the ilk that prefers to live in happy and blissful ignorance of the nightmare you're facing <laughs> ignorance every time <laughs> congratulations sir you've come storming through your medical with flying colors and he yeah. and he maintains it and it, it yeah just that whole interaction was really funny and i i think yeah. it I think that interaction makes that scene probably worthwhile in my eyes. It could have been, I'm not saying it couldn't have been a shorter scene, but I think it's worthwhile Mm. having it there. Fair play, no, great interaction as well, especially from Robert Llewellyn. What was your funniest moment? Mine, uh, it's got to be grind those balls, sir. (laughs) Grind those balls, sir, grind them! (laughs) Just for how unexpected, how how loud and how abrasive it was. And it might sound quite juvenile, but it did get a big laugh out of me. So, yeah, I I had to go with, like, what, again, like we often do, like what, you know, got the biggest laugh out of us. And that was it for me. There was a lot of great mini moments, but yeah, it's got to be that one. So, yeah, call me immature, but it's, 
I laughed at the ball joke, guys. Ha ha, there we go. So, <laughs> but um, finally then, how many scutters would you give it out of 10 on this one? Then? I'm going to give it eight and a half out of 10. Oh, quite high then. Yeah. Yeah. How come? Any standout reasons um, as to why? Or I, I think overall it was just a good episode. I, I enjoyed the... Uh, I laughed more this episode than I did the previous episode, uh, uh-huh. which I gave slightly lower points for because of that. And uh, I thought it was a good story. I enjoyed it was a little bit rushed to the end, admittedly. Um, but no, I think generally it was quite well structured. Again, linking back to something from previous episodes. I like that as well. Yeah, it's just so, it's a lot that I like about it. Fair play. Absolutely fair play. Um, well, I'm giving it a seven. Um, just because, similar to what we discussed last week, there were many moments in this. I, again, just for me personally, I thought either could have you know, been cut or shortened or didn't really grip me that much. Uh, I've already said like the whole medical exam thing. Because, it, because that sort of theme sort of stopped when we got to Rimmer World, I thought, well... It, it made, well for me at least it made that whole opening seem a bit pointless ish to a degree um the ending like yes i'm i'm, I'm hoping it's a two parter um but still another one of those rushed endings uh, not all the jokes landed the whole uh, roman emperor rimmer wasn't really gripping me but on the flip side as i mentioned rimmer has a lot of great moments a lot of great gags there's a lot of the the gags they have in the cockpit especially cat when they realize they've lost rimmer were quite good so yeah, a lot of positive moments, but I wouldn't say this is one of my favourites. You know, it's not one I'd rewatch in a in a hurry. For a story called Rimmerworld, I would have liked to seen a lot more time on Rimmerworld, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's just me. Fair. That's, that's just fair. me. So I'll give it a seven. But yeah, that's another episode in the cat. We've got one more of series six. Can you believe it? Crazy. Just one more, and then that's locked in. But until then, you'll have to wait till next week. But in the meantime. You can check us out. I mean, we've got a Twitter for this podcast, All Dead Dave Pod. You can go and follow us on there for updates on on our show, uh, things regarding Red Dwarf, memes, news. But yeah, go and follow our podcast Twitter, All Dead Dave Pod. And uh, Phil, where can the people find you? You can find me on my YouTube, which is where I put most of my stuff. It is just my name, Philip Hawkins. I talk about geeky pop culture, things like Doctor Who, Star Trek. This podcast is up there. Basically anything that I like and is slightly geeky, so yeah. pop culture wise, love it. We love it. And as Phil said, the, you can find this podcast on his channel as well. That's where it goes out. So make sure you give it a like, leave your comments as well. We love to hear your feedback on the show as well. So what you guys think, and subscribe to Phil while you're at it. And um, if you're surfing the YouTube's, you can find me there as well. Adam Martin with a Y. I also make a lot of pop culture stuff or just things I'm interested in. And you can follow me on Twitter as well at Adam Martin AMTV. So yeah, that's me. Well. Yeah, we're almost at the end of Series 6. Um, crazy. Uh, we've said it before, but for us, this doesn't feel like that long we've been doing this podcast. But hey, here, here we are, however many months later. So hope you join us for then, for Out of Time. I wonder if it's going to be a two-parter. But um, yeah, um, join us for Out of Time. And in the, in the meantime, we'll see you next time. See you then. Bye. Bye.